All right. I believe we are recording. So thank you for joining us for another Reunited. Uh, my name is Corey, and I am excited to have you for another Reunited, uh, where our goal is to reunite the body of Christ with the gospel of the kingdom of God. It uh, looks like we have Lauren and Emerson on the line. My wife is kind of in the background. We have some other uh, uh, other people that will be joining us soon. Uh, but what we're going to do is get into uh, some parables. Actually, um, kind of got a, a reroute, uh, to be honest with you. So we'll take the route that I believe that, that God would have us to take and, and go on about this. Uh, so with that being said, uh, then what I'd like to do is just open us up in, in prayer. Uh, after prayer, then I have a kind of like a, uh, I'm not even know what you call it, but something I'd like to do that I think is very important for moving forward. Uh, so as we're doing that, I'll go ahead and pray. So Father, thank you. Thank you, Father for everything you provided and done, God. Father, you are awesome and amazing, God. There is just no way that I could begin to explain uh, or even to, to comprehend everything that you are and what you are provided. So, Father, what I ask is that tonight uh, that all the distractions be removed, uh, that we be able to hear, uh, be able to see, God, uh, that the people that are on their way, God, the distractions be moved from them, removed from them. If this is a recording for some individuals, God, uh, that they be able to hear everything clear, that the technology work uh, work fine, just everything is just out of the way, Father God, so everyone can hear what you uh, would like them to hear, God. Uh, devil, I bind you, I rebuke you, you will have no victory, Father. I thank you for your host, God, that keep us in all of our ways. Uh, so, Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so this is the way we're going to get started. So, just dealing with some things uh, and, and talking about the parables. First of all, I'd like to ask, uh, who had the opportunity to actually read uh, the parable uh, that we were scheduled to go through in Matthew 25, beginning, I believe, in verse number 14? Who had the opportunity to actually uh, study through that? I got a chance to read it this evening. I read it before, okay. but I went back over it. OK, so when you say read it, Emerson, did you have a chance to actually study it and, and break it down to actually pull out anything or is more or less just going through and just reading it again? I've, I, I've studied it before uh, this today at work. I just I read it back, but I've studied that out before. And uh, so, so, yeah, I, I had before, but didn't today, but read it today. OK, OK, good stuff. So what we'll do is here's what I've been dealing with. And Emerson made mention of this. Um, in our conversation uh, not too long ago, and his comment was roundabout something like this, and he can he can clean me up by saying this. But one of the more difficult things that we have to deal with in dealing with the kingdom of God is that there's so much, um, and we use the word religion, and that's just just to be honest. But I, it's, it's a, I think people have that as a as a different idea or a concept so i want to make sure i understand uh, or i'm clear about exactly what i mean when i say that when i say religion then i look at religion as man's approach to god right man's attempt to be able to justify himself to present himself righteous before god on his own terms okay this is a person who is looking at himself and really totally ignoring uh everything around them and they're they're always trying to appease this god either for uh, more money or uh, used to be for farmers to have a bigger crop. Uh, could be whatever it is. Sometimes it's just a case where they want to present themselves uh, to other people as being godly. So they may not necessarily want to uh, please God, but they want to appear that they're pleasing God in the midst of other people or in front of other people. So with all of that being said, usually these things are, are very independent of what God has actually said that he actually cares about, what he wants, what pleases him, what is his will. Usually this individual, these individuals have a whole gambit of, of traditions and rituals and all types of things that they may have grown up in, right, as, as children or may have just been introduced to uh, coming into uh, that religion. So it's just a, a bunch of things. And the, and the reality is that could be a, a religion such as uh, Muslim or it could be Hindu. It could be um, anything. Right. There's tons of religions all over the all over the world, more than I can actually name. Uh, for most people that are coming on here, I would say that we're probably coming in from a Christian background, right? From from uh, a Christian background, which means you have an origin in Catholicism, whether we want to admit, admit that or not. So we have a number of doctrines, traditions, and ideas that were already fixed. They were 
already put in place. And then usually what happens is we come in and those are, are dumped on us or they're, they're put out to us. And it's rare that we actually question any of those. We just kind of accept them. Uh, if they work, then great. M many times they don't. So we don't really make the time to question it. So the challenge is what happens is you have other people that don't walk you in or out of something, then they come along from a contrary or a different, and then they can talk you out of what you thought to be, but they make something like a so-called truth to you that you didn't know because you never proved what you had anyways. And then they'll break it with if you question what it is that you have, this will you so we're getting people in the plan, but rarely do we have an intimate relationship with God, right? Most of them, even if they actually advertise it, they don't actually follow actually create intimacy or offering it. Hey, you're breaking up pretty bad, Corey. Uh, Cor you're our, breaking up pretty bad. Corey, you're breaking up. Hey, you're breaking up pretty bad, Corey. Break up pretty bad. Yeah, terrible. Is anybody else or is it uh, just me? All right, hold on. Yes, it's breaking up, breaking up for me too. It is breaking up pretty bad. All right, I don't know why I would be breaking up. Just a moment. Sound good there. Okay, so is it any better right now? Sounds real clear now. Is it any better right now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I don't know. Maybe I had something going. So thank you for that. So if you if you get anything, then just let me know, and I'll try to make sure that I can clean it up. Hopefully my signal's cleaning up. Okay. So just just going back. So I'm not sure what you actually got. All I was saying is that everybody's got a different idea of maybe what religion is or what its purpose is. But here's the reality. The reality is is that uh, unless we actually come in like this glass right and this is a very difficult conversation to be honest with you i would rather myself much rather come in and have a conversation with someone that's more like this glass someone that's ignorant and really doesn't know much rather than have someone that's filled up with a bunch of stuff that they can't receive anything right so here's the thing that i had to ask myself and can you can you see this glass hope you can see the glass that should go it. so here's the thing so what happens is normally either you are born or i'm born into a religion okay or any kind of concept and then uh or we maybe have lived life and then we come into this religious idea so what happens is we have all of these ideas that are coming into our lives right they tell us what day we should worship how we should dress how we should speak tell us how god is or what god is what he thinks about all types of things so what happens is is that you have this glass that continues to be filled up OK, so what happens is you have this this glass that continues to be filled up. So what happens is, is that now you have this full glass full of all types of doctrines, full of all types of ideas. And the challenge is now this glass is full. But when someone like me comes along and when I'm sharing something called the gospel of the kingdom of God, here's the challenge. The challenge is, is this glass is always it's already full. So my question to you is. How is it possible for me or anyone else to be able to pour into a glass that's already full? What happens if we pour into it? And anybody can answer that. So if you have a glass full of anything, juice or milk or water, if you have a glass that's already full and you attempt to pour anything into it, then what, what's going to happen? It's going to spill over. What, what did you say, Lauren? I said it was going to spill over or spill out. That, absolutely, right? So it's going to spill over. It's not a hard concept, but what we have to understand for ourselves is, is that we are coming in with a bunch of pre-programmed ideas, and many of those, they don't work. We haven't questioned them. We haven't proved them. We haven't tested them. And here's the be honest, I'm going to be totally honest with you. Many of those things didn't actually come from God himself. Many of those things didn't come from God at all. But we don't know that. So here's what I'm saying to you, because this is what I'm realizing. Up until today, 
uh, out of all the Bible studies that we've done, I believe we're probably right around 60, maybe over 60 Bible studies just with this reunited Bible study. Uh, we've been in parables for some time. There's a number of things I would love to be able to share. I have shared some things, but here's the challenge. The reality is, is that this is what I see, right? I hear it. I hear glasses that are totally full. So then when I'm trying to offer anything, then I realize, man, I don't think we're getting anywhere. I, I, I sent out the parable for today and I'm like, man, you know, I, I'm asking that you have read the parable, that you go in and you dig out some things. And I said, you know what? I think it's a good opportunity to allow people to do this. So I have my glass. So this is what you have to do for yourself. Decide to do this for yourself. And you don't have to, right? But the only way that we're going to be able to move forward together and for me to be a benefit and a help to you is that you'll have to make a decision to do this yourself, right? And you see what happens? This glass was full. And what happens is this glass starts to be empty, right? So every little drip drop, right, of doctrines that you may have taken that may not work, that you want to hold on to, that's your sacred cows, you're going to have to decide if you're going to prove and test them yourself. So if we'll do that, then this is what will happen, that the glass will be begin to be emptied out. And then we can actually take the truths of the kingdom of God and actually pour them in. So what can happen? So that we can have actual life change. No more religion. No more practicing. No more acting. No more pretending. No more hypocrisy is that we will actually to be able to manifest the promises of God and do the things that we're supposed to do. So that's what I'm asking. So the way that we're going to approach tonight is going to be a little bit different because I think it's important to be able to test and prove the ground that we actually have. So I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to ask you to actually answer those. This is going to be a great opportunity for us to be able to, I believe, establish a real foundation so that we can move forward. So the parable that we have, if we can get to it tonight, fantastic. But if we don't get to it tonight, then I'm also happy with that because I believe these things are very important. OK, so I'm going to say a couple things and you feel free. Ask questions. Right. Make comments throughout this. But I'm going to quiz you up. I looked at this as actually actually an open book. So this is going to be a, like an open book quiz. OK, so just feel free to be able to ask. If you don't know, then that's fine. Uh, if you want to share something, that's fine. But I'm looking for a lot of word. Right. So if you have a response. Make time to get into your Bible and find an address for it. OK, so here's how we're going to start. So my note was this. I said that we'll begin with an open book test before we actually start with our parable, even have a chance. Maybe even looking at that. OK, we may not even get a chance to get to it. I said it's di difficult to continue moving forward with so many full glasses. And here's the next word. So little desire. Right. Because what happens in religion a lot of times is that we believe that just because we showed up, that that's good enough. Just because I showed up in a religious setting in the pews, just because I showed up, I logged in, then I believe that that's enough. I believe that that's good enough. OK, but the reality is in life, that's never good enough. Right. Showing up to the gym is never good enough. You go into the gym and you look around at everybody else working out for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, then nothing is going to happen, right? Lauren's on here. She's an incredible athlete. Terry's on here. He's also an incredible athlete. We had other people who have, who have, who have operated in, in sports and athletics. Showing up doesn't do anything, right? It's not until you actually make a decision that you're going to actually put some grit in, to sweat, to actually do what it, ta what it takes and actually do that over a long period of time, time that you actually have a result. So in religion, the challenge is, is that we have been duped into believing that just because I showed up at church on Wednesday or Sunday is that something is going to happen in my life. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to change anything. I can keep all my terrible habits, my bad conversation. I can keep my flawed perspective on everything as long as i know how to act on sunday between these hours and on wednesday wednesdays or it could be saturday some people believe it's the sabbath is a saturday so as long as you believe that you can act the act play the part during that time then things are okay okay so I, what i'm suggesting is is that we're going to be bare and open so that we can actually move forward okay so maybe i'm talking to myself Maybe it's just somebody else that's on the recording. Maybe you don't have this experience, okay? But it's just a case where these are things that I know that are very relevant to a number of people. So what I like for us to do is look at Matthew chapter 11. And anybody that has Matthew chapter 11, read verse 10 
through 13. Again, this is Matthew chapter 11, and this is verses 10 through 13. Anybody that has that, go ahead and read it. Okay, well, maybe you're driving, so I hope that you are able to see this. Sorry. These are scriptures I want you to be able to see and prove for yourself. You have that? Yeah, you said Matthew 11, 10 through 13? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. 10 through 30, oh. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violence take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Good stuff, Lauren. My question to you, Lauren, is, what does this violent by force mean? And I'm going to repeat what it said in 12. 12 says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven, it suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. So what does that mean? And if anybody wants to jump in and answer that, or give uh, an answer, give a scripture. What does that mean? What does this scripture mean? What does it mean that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force? Anybody? And everybody should have something. I always, I always believe that means that, uh, to break it down short, because we don't have a long amount of time, the kingdom of heaven suffering violence, I always believe that that was religion that came against the teaching of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the religious leaders, the ones that Jesus had problems with, or religious teachings, doctrines that, that aren't, uh, like you said, coming from God. So that's the violence that, uh, that it suffers. I believe that. Awesome. And Emerson is suggesting that it is the religion or religious teaching uh, that stands against the, the, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Uh, that's what he's suggesting. Anybody else? What is this violence? It's not the first time that you've seen this scripture, I'm sure. What does this mean? And she has some scriptural references. Anybody? So you should be thinking, right? And again, I said this is more of an open book. So it gives me an opportunity to get an idea of where we are. So in the case where I'm asking again, what does this mean? So no response on that. Here's my next question. What is the violence, right? What is this violence is being used? Now, again, it's saying the kingdom of heaven. This is not a carnal kingdom. It says this violence is being used against the spiritual kingdom. What is this violence? Anybody? Again, I say religious teaching on my part. Good stuff. Thank you, Emerson. Uh, glad to have you, Lionel. We're, we're uh, about to read Hebrews chapter 11. So if anybody has Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number six, go ahead and read that. Let's read Hebrews chapter 11, verse six together. And while that person is pulling up Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, someone else go to Romans chapter 1, verse 17. And anybody that has that, that Hebrew scripture, go ahead and let us know when you're ready so we can keep moving forward. But you should be able to uh, access a Bible, hopefully somewhere, and get to, get to reading. All right, for the sake of time, I'll keep continue to I'll, I'll read and this will be more but Hebrews chapter 11 verse six. listen to listen to this but that faith it is impossible 
and I'm pausing, right? It is impossible to please God. So that is yourself this question. Can I plot with faith? You're because breaking what up we again. do is, is that again, you're, you're breaking, we have an idea that I can plead you're breaking on up my again own. pretty bad. You're breaking up again pretty bad. I'm up again. Yeah. Yeah. Real bad. Okay. All right. Hold on. Okay. Is it any better right now? Is it still still breaking up? Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, Emerson. Just just, just yeah, keep me up to speed so that way I, I have an idea what's going on. So uh, in dealing with that, then and again, this is the, the, the statement. The statement that says it is impossible to please God without faith. So if we don't have any idea about what faith is and we can come up with our own idea of what it is to please God. So I'm going to continue on for he that cometh to God must believe that he is as a requirement and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So you see the presence and importance of faith. I also look at Romans chapter one and I hope that you're writing notes or reading along with me. Chapter one, verse number 17, it says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Right. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And it's almost to a point where we can say that we're not able to truly live without faith. So if we're not able to live without faith, then what are we doing? Right. So that's the way we should look at the importance of what faith is. Also look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 38 right same concept right so i'll just continue on now the just shall live by, by faith right again same statement echo but if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him so this faith is so vitally important okay and you'll find out why i'm saying faith right faith god is consistently saying faith right also look in romans chapter 14 and if anybody has that it's in verse Verse number 23, if you'd like to read, I'll give you a couple of seconds, but it's Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Anybody have that? All right, and I'll go ahead and read it. Romans chapter 14, verse 23 says, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith. Now, this is a very difficult thing. So when we keep this scripture in context, it's talking about diet. It's talking about this food. So there are people that believe that you can be more pleasing in the sight of God based on your diet. So he's saying that, you know, that, that's absolutely ridiculous in the kingdom of God is that that's not the, the, the expectation. The scripture understand the importance of faith. So it's not just talking about diet. It's understanding how important faith is. So it says going on because he that eateth not of faith for who for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That is a truth, right? That is a statement that goes outside of just diet is that anything that we're not able to function in, it could go as far as to be saw as sin. This is the importance of faith. Okay. So here's the thing I said, what are they attempting to access in heaven? So remember, it says that in the scripture that I gave us in, 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 uh, in the beginning, I believe it was Matthew or that Lauren read, Matthew 11 verses 10 through 13 talked about this violence that the kingdom of heaven is facing. So my question is, what are they, what are they attempting to access? Why is there so much violence to the kingdom of heaven? What are they see? What are they seeking to access? So that's my question to you. What were they attempting to access with this violence? What, are, what were they trying to get? Anybody? And you can put something in the chat box. I hope that, that you guys are able to hear me fine. I can hear you. Louis, fine. Did you have a 
are they and we're talking about wickedness like the enemy what is he after our faith in context i'm sorry i kind of was doing something so i want to make sure i'm on track Uh, I, I can hardly hear you. Can you repeat that again? Can you hear me now? A little bit better. Okay, I'm sorry. I said I was a little busy, so I'm trying to piece it all together. But you said, what are they after? Was that the question? Yeah, the question is, uh, from the based on the scripture that says that, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. I'm asking, what were they looking to gain? Why were they trying to bombard heaven? What were they looking to get? I'm a, I'm a pass on it just because I think the way that the question is structured, I'm, I need to understand. It needs to click in my head a little bit more what you're asking. Hey, Corey. 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 Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, can can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you just fine. Hey, you know, I, I don't, I don't quite get the question either. Well, I, I mean, I, I missed out. Maybe I, I don't want to waste. I don't yeah. want to waste time. So no, this is, this, is, this, is, this is good. No, no, you not, not waste any time. So here, here's here's the. The, the question. So the scripture is in Matthew chapter 11, verses uh, 10 through 13, specifically in 12, that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent taketh by force. So there that this would would mean that there are individuals or people who are doing this. These are people that are actually trying to take this kingdom of heaven by force right? The, or, or something that's, that's coming from the kingdom of heaven by force. By force. So my question is, what are they looking to gain? Why are they Why are they trying to uh, come come to the kingdom of violence or the kingdom of heaven by force? Why? What are they looking to gain? Oh. Is my question. Because these are oh, people. I, I think, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I got you. I think. I think uh, uh, coming from me, uh, I think they're they're trying to gain the influence of heaven uh, in their life. I think they're trying to gain truth that comes directly uh, from God. I think they're trying to. Uh, gain everything that 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 God has 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 given us as as far as truth is concerned, as far as life is concerned, as far as the way that uh, we should operate here on earth, because that was his that was his goal was that whatever goes on in heaven needs to go on in earth, and so by me uh, getting the truth behind that, I I'm able to carry that out. But without that truth, then what I'll do, I'll fall into some type of religious nonsense that I've had for years. So that's what I think they were trying to gain. Instruction, influence, uh, uh, living under the influence of God, the, the, the government uh, which Jesus bought, uh, all these things that pertain to the kingdom of heaven. Awesome stuff. Terry Perdue, to add to that, he says, to gain the promise given to Adam, dominion over the earth, rulership, right? So the reality is, is that what we have to understand that this statement is made to some of the most religious people on the entire planet, maybe in history. So these people actually had the promise that was actually given to them. They were actually under the old covenant that they were actually under with God. So these people had something. It's not that they didn't have anything. They had something. But what Terry said is right on point. The reality is that is that all humanity not just the Hebrew Israelites, all humanity had lost everything. Is that everything that God intended for humanity to have was packed in Adam and he forfeited it. So when people are going into religious, religious, you know, settings and they're looking for something, they're looking for something real that was lost. It could be power. It could be authority, right? That people try to access through witchcraft. It could be uh, a, 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 a righteous feeling before God, right? So our righteousness comes through Jesus Christ, but they want to find this sense of righteousness, this justness or feeling justified before this God because they are aware of their sin and their failure, right? These are all wonderful things. 
healing, right? Just the just the just the the benefit, the right of walking and healing and health, peace. That people are looking at the bottom of a of a prescription bottle, right? They go out to a street pharmacist to get marijuana, to get uh, all types of drugs, right? Go to the to the to the to the uh, to the the corner store to get alcohol, right? Go out to the bars to get alcohol. What are they looking for? Peace, right? So the reality is, is that Emerson, you're totally right. Terry, you're totally right. Is that it was all lost. Now, here's the thing we have to understand is that you have this good news that's being preached throughout time saying that it's coming. The king is coming. The kingdom is coming. The opportunity for your rights and benefits is coming. It's coming. It's coming. Now, here's the reality that John the Baptist he is the last prophet before Jesus actually come. The time is at hand. So now the people with great anticipation say, now is my time. Does that make sense? Imagine if you knew for a reality that something you had waited for your whole life was coming the next day. It's like Christmas, right? I, as a kid, I couldn't sleep, right? Thinking Santa Claus is going to come the next day. So the reality is that's a low level way of looking at it. But that anticipation and excitement is what these people had. So there was no way that they were going to be denied. They say, I've been waiting for these benefits. So this is the reason why I asked that question is that grace is, is like a storehouse or an armory that actually stores up all these great things that God already freely gave us. Everything he wanted us to have stored it up by grace. The challenge was is that when, when Adam did what he did, it separated and locked all of these things up so we couldn't access them. So this is the anticipation of Jesus Christ coming back is because now grace and truth comes through Jesus, right? So let's look at Ephesians chapter two, because I want to make sure, again, these things are, are, are very plain to some of you, but I don't think some people have actually heard some of these things. Why? Because we don't really appreciate the, the, the kingdom of God and the reality of what he is if we don't understand these things. So let's look at Ephesians chapter two, and I'm going to read verses eight and nine. And it says, for by grace are ye saved, through faith. And this is a, a challenging way to look at this, because if you don't understand faith and grace, then it doesn't really make this that much sense. So when I said that grace is like a treasury or an armory, everything that God wanted to store for you is stored up in grace. Now, here's the challenge. What good is it for it to be locked up if you don't have no key? If you have no access, no right to be able to access those benefits, what good is it? That is the importance of faith. The challenge is that what we do is we want to access what God has provided in grace by something other than faith. Works won't do it, right? You can't work your way into grace. It ain't going to happen. You ain't got enough money to pay yourself into grace. So God says that the only way that you're going to be able to access grace is by faith. And that does that make sense? And again, these are things that you may have seen before. But this is very important when you understand this violence that the kingdom of heaven is, 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 is taking. OK, so pay attention to this. I'm, I'm making a note here in the kingdom of God. We access nothing from God without faith. The only violence that matters to the kingdom of heaven is faith. The question is, are you violent? You may have been violent in the world, but are you violent in the kingdom of God? We have have been way too passive it is violence or nothing being passive will reduce nothing this is not mean or evil but it is a persistence and intentionality is being intentional so here's the challenge thing called the king we're passive right we have like hoping that things may work out right Get things taken from us, all kinds of things goes on or whatever it is. Things that we don't understand the power of the You're access that we have, which is faith. We want to make sure that we are acting as a task force. Yes, I'm just saying. You're breaking up again pretty bad. I'm breaking up again. Yeah, yeah.
and I'm not sure. Uh, I just switched internet connections, so I'm not sure what that actually does as far as what you're actually. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, clear, clear now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, we hear you clear. Cool. Yeah, let's see. Thank you for doing that because I, I wouldn't have any idea uh, if if we were able to to hear me or not. So, uh, with this being the way that it is, this is something that's very important. Uh, these notes are available online. I encourage you to to actually review them. I'll do my best to continue on. Uh, if it breaks up and you miss some portions of it, you can always access it online. Uh, but the major thing that I'm, that I'm making sure that we get to, to understand how important faith is. So this violence that, that the people are, are coming to heaven with, it's not a bad thing. The reality is, is that heaven cannot be assaulted by anybody. It has no threat to anybody. So the only way that you're going to access anything and I'm going to access anything, access anything to, from heaven is by faith. That's God's requirement. So this violence, this pressure, this intentionality is, is this this thing is, is the people. They are saying, I want my rights. I want my benefits. Right. So they're pressing in because now they see the opportunity has actually come for them to actually get their benefits. OK, again, this is all just making sure I'm laying a, a, I think I think a very good foundation for why these parables are so important, why the kingdom of God is so important. Look at Genesis or actually Galatians chapter 16, uh, actually chapter 2 verse 16 so again make sure i repeat repeat that galatians chapter 2 verse 16 and i'm going to read that and it says knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by the faith of jesus christ even we have believed in jesus christ that we might be justified by what faith and it says by the faith of jesus christ not faith in right faith of because we actually take on his faith and not by works of the law for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified okay so my question is how do we see the kingdom of god anybody have the scripture about how do we actually see the kingdom of god right so we're establishing the importance of wanting you know to, to have these benefits from heaven is the only way that we can actually access anything in the kingdom of god is by faith so now we're saying here moving as, as transition kind of transitioning into this kingdom of God and not my priority, but Jesus priority. There are many people who want the benefits of the kingdom of God. They want those benefits. They may not know it's in the kingdom, but they want them. So how is it that they can't see the kingdom? And there's a scripture that tells us how we're able to see the kingdom of God. Anybody have that scripture? It tells us how we're able to see the kingdom of God. And as you're pulling that up, then my question is, again, how do we see the kingdom of God? Choosing to believe comes before seeing in the kingdom of God. Pay attention to what I'm saying. A choice to believe actually comes before being able to see in the kingdom of God or to see the kingdom of God. We must choose to believe before we can see in the kingdom of God. We must choose to trust God. OK, so again, my question was, how do we see the kingdom of God? And Terry, I see you put uh, Matthew six and thirty six and thirty three. That's coming up, but that's not the one I was looking for. Great one. Go to uh, John chapter three, verse number three. And let's take a look at that. And this is how we see the kingdom of God. And again, I said this is more like an open book lesson. These are things that we should know. We've gone over some of these things before very important for making sure we understand how this stuff works john 3 and 3 says jesus answered and said unto him verily verily i say unto thee except a man be born again he cannot right this is not a negotiation it says that he cannot see the kingdom of god that's 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 the truth how do we enter into the kingdom of god is my next question anybody have the scripture that says how we actually are able to enter into the kingdom of God. Where is that found at? And I know that I you uh, that you know how, how do we how do we enter into the kingdom of God? I don't I don't have my Bible with me. I'm, I'm at work here. But I think it's in that same uh what you just read, isn't it? I think it's around in the same area, isn't it? Yep. You got it. Thank you, Emerson. So go down to verse number five. Okay, so it's John chapter three and verse number five. 
it says that Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, pay attention, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God, right? Non-negotiable. You cannot, cannot enter in. So many citizens enter into the United States every year. Yet some thrive and many others barely survive. Pay attention to what I'm saying. I'm making a comparison between our experience here in the United States and with what should be our experience within the kingdom of God. OK, so you have your citizenship. People are gaining citizenship every day, but then some do well and then some don't do very well. So my question was, why? Right? Why does that happen? We all have access to the same benefits as citizens in this country. It's the same way with the kingdom of God. Access is the first step, right? Actually gaining your, your citizenship gives you access. That's the first step. But access does not guarantee anything. That's like saying someone that comes here in the United States, go through the whole natural process of gaining citizenship. Does that mean that they're going to be on the Forbes 500 list? Right. Does that mean that all the troubles are over? And we know that that is not the case. Why? Because you can go to any ghetto in any city in the United States and you can find out that it's not working for some people yet. They have citizenship. Right. So we are free to live poor, broke, wealthy or rich as a citizen. That is your right. That choice is ours. So if access is the first step then how do we gain access is what I'm asking. I'm talking about this as far as the kid, a citizen, uh, as a citizen of the kingdom of God. So again, we read that that was actually read in John three and five. So my question to you is how do you see the kingdom of God? And then how do you enter into the kingdom of God based on this scripture? What does that say? So if somebody asks you, what are you going to say to him? How do you do that? What is the scripture telling us? <laughs> Be born of the water and of the spirit. Amen. So Emerson says born of the water and the spirit. You must be born again. Right. It's a powerful thing to understand that. So you as a physical body, this, this dirt human body, you came through a woman. Right. All of us did. So we came through a woman when the, the this time came, the water was broken. So you passed through the water. OK. Blood was also present there. So it's a case where that physical body, you had to actually first have a physical body. So it means that demons cannot inherit the kingdom of God. They don't have no right. They don't have no physical body. They don't have any authority to actually do that. So that's the first thing. And then we must be born again. Right. So let's look at Romans 10 and 9. I don't want to pass through any of this. OK, stuff that we've probably seen before. Again, how are we born again? OK, Romans 10 and 9 says this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, he says what? Thou shalt be saved. This is a truth. So anybody that wants to see the kingdom of God, anybody that wants to enter into this, the kingdom of God, then the reality is that the person has to make this confession. This is a part of the citizenship. So if there's someone that says, I don't agree with that, but I want the benefits of your kingdom, you tell them, that's not the way this goes, right? <laughs> That's not the way it's going. You don't decide what way you actually gain citizenship into the kingdom of God. That's not the way it goes. So my next question was, what part of me is reborn? What part of me is reborn? As I don't want to, I don't want to say this next word because I'll give the answer out. So my question is, what part of you is reborn in this process? Anybody? And you can put that in the chat box or you can unmute yourself. Your spirit. Good stuff. Emerson says, spirit, Lauren, what were you going to say? Same thing, spirit. Same thing. Thank you very much. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. These are very important things, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. Okay, these are, these are this is the way this works. And it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. So you have to accept that. That when you confess hope and faith in Jesus Christ, you may have done some foolish, crazy, stupid stuff yesterday or any other time in your past. But you being reborn, you as a spirit being, that was not you. That sounds crazy to think about. So that's the reason why you can you can you can be forgiven for all your sins. You literally are a brand new person as a spirit being. OK, you got to be able to get that. Why? Because if you don't get that, 
then you allow sin consciousness to continue to hang around and hold you to stuff that you ain't got no business being held to. Now you can you can you can apologize to people and make stuff right, but understand but between you and God, all of that stuff is cleared away. He sees you as perfect, okay? Because you're different. You're not the same. You are a different person spiritually. I'm gonna keep reading. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God. Who hath reconciled us to himself by who? Jesus Christ. And hath given us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. So it means that you have been reconciled and that that automatically, it's like it ignites you, right? Not ignites you, but like, like a person that's, that's being knighted into a kingdom, it ignites you to now take on that ministry of reconciliation, the serving of other people to help reconcile them back to God or allow you to speak a word to allow them to be reconciled to God. Okay. That's the power of it. So you are three parts, spirit, soul, and body. You are a spirit being living in a dirt, humus body with a soul. You are spiritually made brand new, but God's desire is that all of us be made new, which is our whole person, all of what we are. So to, to make sure I'm being clear, you, when you confess hope and faith in Jesus Christ, I, when I confess as a spirit being, I become brand new. But my soul is not, not automatic, not automatically, not in an instant, right? My body is not in an instant, it's not changed. So some people don't believe that, that we are spirit, soul, and body. There are people that you will come to that believe that you are a soul in a physical body, but we are not spirits. What scripture do we use to know that we are spirit, soul, and body. What scripture? What scripture is that? Anybody can give us that. First Thessalonians five twenty three. Let Perfect. me also mm -hmm. let me also let me also say one thing too. Uh, uh, be, be, because of this, like you said, we, we we and you say we are a spirit. We don't have a spirit. I think that needs to be really understood. That's what we are. We are a spirit. We don't have a spirit. That's who we are. Just want to emphasize that. Go ahead, bro. Thank you so much for emphasizing that. It's very important that you are a spirit. So when God is connecting with you, when you are connecting with God, God is a spirit. Right. And we worship him in spirit and in truth. Very important. OK, because we have a, a more correct relationship and expectation with a God who is a spirit, knowing that I am a spirit. So God's not trying to connect with you on, on a carnal basis. It doesn't mean he can't impact you in a way that you can sense something with your feelings, but that's not the way that it is. This is a spiritual walk, okay? So very, very important. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Emerson. And he gave us 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, okay? These things are very important. The reason why I'm making sure I give you the scriptures, I'm taking time to work through this, is because we're all coming from all these different backgrounds, and I cannot assume that you already know these things. I cannot. I've done that in the past, and I think that's, that's, that's not something I should have done. So... You yourself should know this. And if you had to have a conversation with someone, these are scripture references that you have for you yourself to stand on and to help that person out also. So I'm going to read that first Thessalonians chapter five and verse twenty three. And it says. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that. Is one scripture as other ones. OK, but that's one that's very good that explains and actually shows us that we are three parts. Right. That we are. We actually are three part. Also look at. Um, First Corinthians, chapter three, verse 16. OK, and I'll make this note. My note is I ask the question, why does God want to re renew you as a spirit being? Why is that important? OK. So think about it. And I'm, I'm making sure I say all of this. OK, because it's these things make a make make. These are very important. Everything access are stored up in grace. Everyone wants it. They're trying to access it. They can't access it outside of faith. God has given you the faith of Jesus Christ to access everything. This citizenship into the kingdom of God allows you to be able to see the kingdom only being reborn. You're being reborn as a spirit being. It also allows you to enter into the kingdom of God. Very, very important. OK, so as we're walking through that, understand who you are as an identity, that you and I are spirit beings in a physical dirt body with a soul. 
And when we're going forward, I'm saying, OK, why is it so important that I be as a spirit being be made brand new? Why is that so important to God? Why does God think it's so important that you be made new spiritually as a spirit being? And actually, that's who, because that's who we originally were from the beginning. That's who we were from the beginning. And so all we're doing is just returning to our original identification, to our, to our original who we are. Uh, we we are not as you've been mentioning that we are not our soul, we are not our body, but we are our spirit. And the only way to connect to God is to return back to who we are, and that's who we are. So if we don't get that down, then we can we can forget about everything else. Amen. So I look at it as a as a return to default setting. So when you have some items that you may have purchased or you have that don't work right, sometimes you can press something that that goes back to default, right? So this is our original setting. This is the way it was always supposed to be. This is Adam, right? So Jesus came as the last Adam, but the first Adam, this was our original intent. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 16, it says this, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Pay attention to this because sometimes we don't think of ourselves as being the temple of God. The, the holy temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans not long after the crucifixion of Jesus. Okay, Jesus prophesied it and then it actually happened. God does not desire to dwell in a building made by man, regardless of what we think and how pretty and, 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 and uh, expensive we think these buildings are. God does not desire to dwell in these buildings, okay? He does not desire to, to dwell in a, in a building made by man. God desires to dwell within you. He wants to make you his temple. If you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, then you are his temple. God is dwelling within you now. So you can stop right now because this may have been the first time for some of us that we actually said that. You could have been doing some crazy foolishness at any point in your life. I've done some really stupid stuff in my life. But here's the reality. You stop and say now, I am the temple of God. That God dwells within me. Say that. I mean, say it out loud. It's crazy to even think about that. But this is the reality of who you are. So tomorrow, if you think about doing something stupid, that doesn't change. You're going to take that stupidness. Right. And you're going to take God right along with you when you're doing that stupidness, because your decision doesn't change the reality that you still are the temple of God. That's the, that's that's the reality of it. OK, I hope that makes sense. And I, will, I'll, I just want to make sure I say that and we'll continue to move forward. So my question is. How can I experience the fullness of this reality? Because you're saying, Corey, I don't even know. Some days I feel like it, most days I don't. So how can I make this a real experience in my life? So my, my, my response is by giving permission for God to immerse and baptize your soul. Right. How does that happen? He might got a scripture scripture that helps us understand how me as a renewed beard, uh, renewed spirit can can make sure I have this immersion, this feeling happen in my life. Yes. By, by by number one, I don't have the scripture right at hand, but I believe it does come by this way, too, by renewing your mind to who you are. Your mind has to be renewed, but that's who I am. I am a spirit. I'm not flesh. I'm not feelings. I'm not emotion. I am a spirit, but my mind has to be renewed. So if there's no, if there's no renewing of the mind, you can have all this and be all this, but you'll never know it because you're so led by your emotions and feelings and soul. But you never know it unless you renew your mind to this thing constantly eating a steady diet of it. I desire the word of God more than my necessary food. That's what the psalmist lets us know. That's how we should begin to renew your mind. Amen. Amen. I love it. I love it. Uh, any, anybody else? Actually, I'll go ahead and I'll... I'll I, what, what were you going to say, Lauren? Well, I don't know the... I think washing yourself in the word, constantly being in the word. Yep. Good stuff. That's another great response. So here's the reason why I'm saying that. Uh, because of depending on what your experience is, that you may have never heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not supposed to be a new thing. If you go back into the book of uh, Acts at the first church experience in those first three chapters, it shows us actually the whole book of Acts. You see it. Here's the challenge. Because religion has 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 separated a lot of these truths, then you may have come to God, confess hope and faith in Jesus Christ because you didn't want to go to hell or because you wanted forgiveness of your sins. And then what they did was they led you through a confession and then they baptized you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They didn't tell you anything about the Holy Spirit. You didn't have any idea that God wanted to dwell within you. He wanted to live within you. 
None of that. And this was the same experience that some people had in the book of Acts. You can actually see at least two accounts that I can think about where someone had to go back to these people after they were baptized and actually lay hands on them or have an experience so they can actually receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So here's the challenge. The reason why I say that I myself had no idea. I grew up in a Baptist church. I was baptized. I knew that things had changed because I felt guilty for doing the things I was doing. But I didn't have the power to do anything against. it. I just knew I felt guilty. The Bible didn't really make that that much sense to me. So I, I broke down on my knees in my dorm room at the age of uh, 23 and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I knew for a fact at that point, I didn't know that I was I was actually being immersed and filled with the Holy Spirit. But I knew something was totally different. Right. Even though I was saved, I was reborn as a spirit being something had not totally taken hold. Right. And I've had this experience with other people. I've read books of, to of, of people. And it's a sad thing that when we're coming into our relationship with Christ, that many people have never heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing that's challenged. And the challenge is, is that that doesn't fix everything. So just because you uh, uh, ask for and I'll, I'll read this scripture before I go on. It's in, uh, in, in Luke chapter 11, verse number 13. You ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You give permission for this great spirit of God that's dwelling in you to actually be able to immerse and fill your soul. You want to be filled, brimming over with the Holy Spirit. And it says, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more, right, shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So my question was, what does Jesus compare this reality to? What term does Jesus Christ use for what exists in you as a reborn and Holy Spirit filled believer. There is something that exists inside of you, uh, exists inside of you that's more powerful than any earthly kingdom combined. And I ask this, what is it and what is it called? Right. And this is the challenge because we have all these religious ideas that are spread out all over the place. And then we were bringing this thing in together so we understand that this is the gift that God wanted us to have. So we're, we're at the point where, again, renewed as a spirit being, asking the Holy Spirit to baptize and, and, and immerse me and fill me. Someone could lay hands on you. You could be baptized and be and come out of the water and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Read through the book of Acts. You see all types of ways. But the reality is, is that God wants to have this experience for us because he is the power. He is the dudamus. OK, Lionel had a, a wonderful testimony where he experienced that. So I know it was a, a lot to ask. So what, what I'd like for you to do is look at, 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 uh, at Luke chapter 17. Now I'll end with this scripture for today and then we'll, we'll, we'll just pause, see if there's any questions or comments before we move on, because these things are vitally important. I cannot continue to move on trying to uh, go into any more parables without us making sure we understand where we need to be at and dealing with some of these things. So in Luke chapter 17. Verse number 20 and 21. I'm going to read this. And it says, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, lo there. For behold, where is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is within you. Right. So you have the most powerful kingdom in history dwelling on the inside of you. That's the reality of what's going on. So when we're trying to make this kingdom thing real. Then th this is what God is missing. So you may have heard some of these concepts broken in different places. But the reality is, is that Jesus Christ himself didn't do anything without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. OK, so we'll, we'll get into some of those scriptures at some point. Um, uh, maybe next week, but I encourage you get into the notes. You can look at that because what we have to make sure we're understanding is when we come on the line is that you can't do anything without without God. Can't do anything without Jesus Christ. God never intended for you to do a work with him without the power of the Holy Spirit. God did not give you a religion. I don't care what the name of your religion was. God didn't give you no religion. Right. So the reality is, if we continue to try to connect with God through these other ways, other than just taking what God has given to us, we're not going to have the experience that God has for us. Right. We're probably going to step on some toes. We're, we're not going to see eye to eye about some doctrines. Why? Because those doctrines, they don't filter through the kingdom of God. So 
when you're looking through the kingdom of God, again, I said it's like lenses that we should be able to view the whole entire Bible through because this is the priority. This is the precept. This is the original intent of God. We should see through the lenses of the kingdom of God. So the doctrines that many of us may have heard, they may not. They may not fit. The power of the parable is, is that Jesus Christ is teaching us the doctrines of God himself. Jesus doesn't teach any doctrines outside of God the Father. So when we when we hear these parables and we're learning these parables, when you're reading through these parables, then you're literally learning the, 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 the doctrines of God unfiltered. Right. Untainted by by man and, and twisted up and all those types of things. OK, so uh, I want to make sure I continue with this next week. I know that you may have been uh, prepared to actually look at the parable. I don't think anybody truly studied the parable. So what I would ask you to do is, is take this week to actually look through some of the previous parables. Go back through the parable of the sower. It says if you don't understand this parable, how do you understand all parables? I don't think many of us understand the truths that are in the parable of the sower. Go through that. OK, look at some of the other parables we've gone through. We have archived videos. OK, but the most important thing is if you have not asked for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, shame on you. These are tools that we need. You're not going to be able to understand what God wants you to have without the Holy Spirit. And then just because you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean he's going to force himself on you. He's not going to teach you anything that you don't desire and give him permission to teach you. So place a, 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 a really tough demand on the Holy Spirit. Say, I need to know this. Teach me these parables. Show me what it is that Jesus wants me to know. How does this impact my life? What do you want this to be? To, to, to be for me and to be for other people. You place a demand on the Holy Spirit. No more games, no more gimmicks, okay? Here's a, the way I'll end. The reality is, is that everyone else is, is being very aggressive and they're not holding back. I turn on the television, I see commercials uh, with, with transgender people, which is, is fine, okay? Uh, but I understand the agenda is to use these people because there's other people that want to use the transgender people to try to make sure they get their agenda pushed. The transgender person doesn't know it. They're being used same way with, again, same sex uh, person, 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 people that will be called homosexuals. I don't have anything against homosexuals. But the reality is that these people are being used to push an agenda. So when I turn on my television, I look at cartoons with my kids and I see homosexuals on, on the on, uh, homosexual agendas in the cartoons. My reality is I said, man, here's the thing is that even though I don't push my views on other people, they don't ask me permission to, to push their ideas on me. Alcohol is on every other every other commercial. Right. My kids can't watch any type of television uh, shows without seeing a, an advertisement for alcohol, trying to get them to drink. If it's not every other commercial, then it's probably every three commercials or something for, for some type of alcohol. Right. Uh, uh, some type of sexual uh, uh, suggestion, trying to trying to over sexualize a woman or a man to try to tell them that that's their purpose in life. Right. All types of things. Right. Idolatry is everywhere trying to get you to worship a car, worship a house, worship everything. Idolatry is in everything. So here's the thing I'm telling you. Playtime must be over. So the way that you have understood church to be, that time is over and it's past. I'm telling you. Right. So there is witchcraft. There is sorcery. There's all types of things that people are using to try to mind control, to try to take control of people, to force them to do what they want them to do. That's the reality. So either you're going to tap into the spirit realm and the most kingdom, most powerful kingdom that ever existed, which is the kingdom of God, and actually function in the reality of what Jesus Christ, that he preached, that he demonstrated and that he taught. Either you're going to do that or I'm telling you that you're going to find out that all of this crazy crap that you've been learning for your life, the rest, most of your life that ain't working, you're going to find out. Right. All these crazy diseases that's coming out, right? And I understand people talking about get vaccinated. I'm vaccinated, right? I got the vaccination that I need. So every new strand that they come out with, it don't make me no difference, right? I don't get scared on none of that. I'm not telling you what to do. What I'm saying to you is, is that if you haven't opened your eyes up to see that there are things that are going on that should force you to step into the role that God has already given to you and actually see a change, I don't know what world you're living in. Because they don't care how old your kids are. They don't care. They don't care about you. If you will let them take it all, they're going to take it all. Okay. So with that being said, make sure that you understand for yourself, right? Where you stand at with the kingdom of God. Again, if you will passively pursue the kingdom of God, you ain't going to get nothing. If this is not something you can, that you will not live without, you will. I've said that. 
So you have to decide for yourself, how serious are you? Will you be violent with your faith? Right? You've been violent out there in the streets. You've been doing stupid stuff, violent to go drink alcohol, violent to go take drugs, violent to go have sex with people. You didn't back up, right? If it was a drug you wanted, you did everything you had to do to go get it. But when it comes to things of God, for whatever reason, you like, ah, you know, I'm sleepy. <laughs> I'm tired, right? How does that work, right? They're trying to take over everything in your life and you tired now, right? You weren't tired when you was going out doing crazy stuff late at night. You wasn't too tired, had to get up in the morning, still doing the, the, the crazy stuff that you was doing. Okay, so anyways, I said I'd be done uh, at eight, so I'm a little bit over. I'm done, but I encourage again that you that you get into this stuff so we can actually get something out of these parables. I'm getting a lot out of it. I want to make sure that you're getting everything that God wants you to get out of it, okay? I want to make sure that, again, it is a workout expectation, that we're working out together. I want you to walk around spiritually buff, right? Don't be looking at other people pointing at their anointing. Oh, look at them. Oh, look at them. Screw that. Get your spiritual anointing built up. Get your spirit man built up, right? You get strong in the spirit so that we can actually do the things that God wants us to do. And that's what this process is about. That's what these Thursdays are supposed to be about. So I'm done. Does anybody have any comments, any questions, anything to be said? I know I threw a lot at you and I took a different direction that I know you're probably expecting tonight. Any comments, any questions, anything uh, to, uh, before we end tonight? Yeah, I just want to say you made a statement, and I'm not going to hold you. But you said we can't do anything without God, which is so true. So let me also add to that, that God won't do anything without us on this earth. That's why he gave us dominion on this earth. He said, let them have dominion. So because we've been given dominion, God won't do anything. We can't do anything without him, and he won't do anything on this earth without us. So let's not never forget that, and let's renew our mind everything that you've been saying. I'm done. Awesome, Emerson. Thank you. Uh, and you made the, the point of making sure we engage in the process of the renewing of our mind. You can look at Romans chapter 12. Uh, remember, you are, are, are pure. I'll say it that way as a spirit being. But you, as far as your carnal mind and your soul, your mind, your will and emotion, that stuff is not going to change unless you willfully participate, bringing ourselves before the word of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit and allowing him to actually bathe us in the word. None of these ideas are going to change. And uh, uh, Lauren actually may mention, I believe, of us being uh, uh, sanctified. I think it was the word that she used. I may, be, I may be wrong. But I know what you said, Lauren, is right in alignment with the changes that have to be made. We, we must do these things. I mentioned being baptized with the Holy Spirit, which is a part of it. But the things that you said, Lauren, the things that you said, Emerson, is spot on. We need all of it. So if we don't have maturity, spiritual maturity that's manifesting in our lives, this is the reason why. It's wrong doctrines, and we are not renewing our minds. We're not doing that, okay? And we're not having the opportunity to see through the kingdom of God. Get serious. I'm telling you, this thing has totally transformed my life and transformed the lives of a number of other people. When you really get locked in and you stay up late at night studying the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and you really will refuse to start living without it, like I will not live without the truths of the kingdom, I'm telling you, something will happen that will, will spark in your life, and you will like, what in the world happened? It's like you'll be totally transformed in an instant on the inside of you, and you're like, man, something just happened, and you'll know that something happened, and that I want that for you, and it's a very important thing, not to just say that you have it, but, but because I'm telling you, the life change that you know is, is for you. The one you desire, the one that keeps you up at, at night, the one that keeps you working every single day, that those things that you really, really want on the inside of you that you really desire, that you know should be yours, those things are yours. You can have them. God's not trying to keep those things from you. I'm telling you, they're yours. So it's right around the corner, just making sure that we are, again, renewing our minds, being sanctified, depending on the Holy Spirit, okay, getting serious about this thing. And I'm telling you, things will totally transform in your life. Any other comments? Uh, any questions, any scriptures, anything before we before we end tonight? Uh, yeah, I have something. Um, my wife is gone. You know, she's out of town right now. And uh, normally when uh, she goes out of town, you know, I wrestle with addiction. So I would I would store cocaine when she's not around. So she's gone. So I've, I've been wrestling a little bit. I've been wrestling a little bit. So I was in my pool and I'm thinking, how am I going to do this? How am I going to, 
stay away from that stuff. How am I going to do it? Then I had to remind myself, I have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. I quit wrestling. I said, you know what, devil? You leave, you leave here now. You go somewhere because you have no business to be with me. Go. Normally, I would have a hard time sleeping. I slept good last night. I was almost late. I said, wow, I can't believe I had a good eight hours of sleep. I couldn't believe it. I quit begging. I quit asking. I said, no, you go, because I have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. And I didn't have to worry about it no more. I ain't worried. That's all I got to say. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. Did you have something else you wanted to say, Emerson? No, I just I just wanted to tell my brothers that 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 that's that's the key component is to allow the spirit to do this. The battle isn't his, and it's not a battle like he said. He has the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is defeated, and he will do it also. Amen to that, brother. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Emerson. Thank thank you for being willing to to, to share that. Uh, it's just a it's just a wonderful thing. Here here's the thing. There are people right now, not tomorrow, and I'll say yes, there are some people that, that were in, in drug addiction that died in overdose that don't have today, right? There are people that intentionally killed themselves. They could have uh, uh, did that in a car accident. Many of the car accidents that are fatal, we don't realize there are people that actually committed suicide. They actually intentionally decided that they want to end their life, and they felt like that was a way that they actually could do that. Okay, that's a reality. There are people that maybe don't want to kill themselves, but they don't really want to live. OK, so they're drinking a lot, gallons of alcohol. OK, they're in all types of uh, drugs. OK, it may not be drugs. It could be a, a, a case where you are in some type of a sexual thing. OK, that you just feel like is giving you what what you actually need to feel validated in your life. Whatever the thing is, understand that this is the reality of the world we live in. There are tons of people on antidepressants, legal or, or illegal. There are tons of people that wrestle with all types of things every single day. We have to stop ignoring all these things. Why? Because you have solutions on the inside of you. Lionel is a living proof of the reality. That's a living proof. So that's the reason why I get so upset when I turn on the TV and see so much alcohol, right? I go down the street and see a place where you can legally get marijuana and you can get uh, drugs that are made of marijuana legally, man. Like, what do you mean? You know, those people are gonna, gonna, gonna use that and that could possibly lead them to go use something that's more hard Right. You're going to ruin their life. You don't even care nothing about that. These are the people that's dealing with stuff every single day that we're dealing with. We have to be serious about the solutions that we have. So when Lionel saying that, understand the reality. Galatians chapter five is a powerful scripture. When I was when Lionel was talking, I thought about that. Sometimes what we want to do is we want to fight too much against something. He said something powerful. I'm standing in my authority. I'm not going to back down. I'm telling you, get out of my house. Devil, leave me. Leave me alone, standing in that authority. But in Galatians 5, it talks about us walking in the spirit. Lionel is beginning to learn how to walk in the spirit. You don't have to fear the flesh. You ain't got to spend all your time trying to read books and do all kinds of crazy stuff to figure out how to defeat the flesh. All you have to do is figure out how do I begin to walk in the spirit? Because as a reality, it shares that it is impossible for us to fulfill the lust of the flesh while we're walking in the spirit, you say, whoa, what do you mean? So if I'm dealing with some type of sexual thing where I'm trying to say, no, I shouldn't be doing this or drinking or drugs or alcohol or whatever the thing is, you mean to tell me that if I can start to perfect this walking in the spirit, then I don't have to worry about this flesh? Yeah, I'm telling you that, right? I know for me, this is my life, right? I'm telling you the addictions I had to deal with in my own life. That's the way that it happened for me. I didn't become an expert on fighting the flesh, right? No. What I did was is try to figure out how does this walk in the spirit work? And as I began to, to know how to walk in the spirit, then I wasn't fulfilling the lust of the flesh. That is easier said than done. But I'm telling you, that's where the victory is. So thank you, Lionel, so much. And there's many other people out there that want that type of victory. And we're going to make sure that they have the information they need to get that. Yes, Emerson. I just want to say to Lionel, to me, to anybody on the fly, oftentimes we celebrate. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what I'm No, let me tell you something, brother. That's who we are. You understand that? That's who we are. That's who we are. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. It's not that I've obtained anything. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. 
Hey man, did you have anything else you want to add to that, Emerson? Or was that was it, was that was you finished? That, that that was my point. Yeah, that was my point. That's who I am. That's a, yeah, yeah. That's how, that's that's why I walk like that. Listen, that's why I live like that. That's why I breathe like that. That's why I move like that because I've got my original identity back, and that's what I do. That's what I do. So yeah, that's that's it. That's it. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. So I, I have something else to say, too, real quick. Now, my cocaine addiction got so bad, it this took me by storm. I had no idea that it would even get me like that. Next thing I know, you know, I, I did it you know, casually. Next thing you know, I'm a, I'm a full-blown addict, and I, I couldn't believe it. So I used to go to bed with cocaine in my mind. I used to wake up with cocaine in my mind. And it wasn't until I got that spirit of the baptism to where I can I can tell that addiction to leave. It wasn't until then that I was able to kick it. You know, I have to I have to continually do it. I have to continually tell that demon to leave, but it goes when I tell it to go. I can manage to leave and it leaves. I might have to keep doing it day to day, but it it'll leave. That's that's awesome. Anybody else have any comments or questions before I make a, a, la a last comment before we before we do, we're done tonight? Thank you so much, Lionel. Thank you, Emerson. Anybody else? Any other comments, questions? All right, all right. So again, I'm saying to you, get violent, right? No more punking, right? I, when I was out, uh, I played football and I was a fullback. That's what I did. So most people don't know that uh, I actually you know had a scholarship in uh, in, in football and. Uh, I actually uh, got a scholarship as a fullback. I only played one year as a fullback in high school, and all I did was just try to run over people. And uh, for whatever reason, you know, I was able to get the scholarship, got there. And then here's the thing is there's a trip to think about is I spent five years of my life. I paid for my education. My education was paid for by me running into people, running, plowing people over. That was my job, right? I want to get these books paid for. I'm going to take you out. Now, here's the thing. What sense does it make for me to have that type of intensity, that type of violence? And on the football field and then get saved, baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost and then punk out. That don't make sense. It don't mean I go out and try to knock people over in the streets and try to push them over. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that I should be far more aggressive and intentional about my spiritual walk and making sure that I can help people break an addiction if that's what they want. OK, to be able to have the information, allow their souls to be saved, if that's what they want, to be able to enter into the kingdom of God, to have all the benefits and, the, and all those things manifest in their life. How would I, what would I look like being a punk? I ain't been no punk my whole life. How would I be a punk now? That don't make sense. So what I'm saying to you is, is that you have to make sure that you start to, to get yourself ready to be able to stand like Lionel's talking about. Your fight may not be cocaine. It could be something else. Everybody gonna have some fight. I'm telling you. To think that you're not going to have some type of temptation, trial, tribulation, right? You must be crazy. So what I'm saying is, is that you put your heels in the ground and you decide no more. I'm not a punk. You get the word of, of God on your mouth and you fight with your mouth. You use the word of God on your mouth and you allow those things to begin to sow the seeds to be sown to fight for you. Right. That's a very important thing. It has to happen. OK, uh, I'll, I'll end like this is my last statement. My statement is this. If you confess hope and faith in Jesus Christ and you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, OK, even if you're not baptized with the Holy Spirit, if you confess hope and faith in Jesus Christ and you became a spiritually new person, you are an exact replica of Jesus Christ. When God sees you, he sees Jesus Christ as a spirit being. That is the reality. So here's what I'm saying to you. If you or people that you know have confessed hope and faith in Jesus Christ, if they are smoking, drinking, lying, stealing, fornicating, if they're doing all those things, they are being a liar. Pay attention to what I'm saying. I'm not saying hypocrite because you say that you are a Christian and then you're smoking and drinking. I'm not saying that. If you are doing those things, then you are being a liar because it doesn't say who you are as a spirit being. God's sees you as a king, lowercase k-i-n-g. God sees you as a priest. God sees you as a saint. God sees you as an ambassador. God sees you as all these things as a reality. So if the saint goes and starts to smoke dope, you lying. You ain't. No, they know. I'm telling you. <laughs> 
after you reborn, you try to go out there and do the same stuff that you was doing, they're going to look at you like, man, something's different about you. You're not the same. Now you're a liar. You're a hypocrite. So why live a life that's a lie? Since you have been spiritually brand new and made new, go ahead and live that life. Engage in the process of having your, your, your soul be, be sanctified, having your mind be renewed, have your, your physical body and your soul align with who you are as a spirit being. Live righteous. Yeah, that's right. Jesus Christ is your righteousness. You are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. That is the reality. If you do anything else, you're lying. You're living a lie. You'll be a hypocrite. So I'm saying that because sometimes we don't realize that that has already happened for us as spirit beings. I am already righteous. I ain't trying to be righteous. I'm already justified. I ain't trying to be justified. I already have all power. I have all things, right? I already got all authority. I'm not trying to get authority, right? We're trying to get something we already got. Once you start to get the, the, the reality that you already got it, you say, man, if I go out here with all this power, all this authority and allow you to punk me, I'd be lying. I'm a hypocrite because somebody going to think I'm a punk, but I'm a king. <laughs> that ain't going to work. Right. So just get that. Get that mindset is what I'm trying to help to make sure we understand. So, again, when it's like Lionel's dealing with what he's dealing with, no, he ain't no punk no more. No, dude, get up out of my house. And you'll see that the longer that you engage in a process like that, making your stand against against the, the, the this demonic forces, these ideas that try to come against you, it won't be hard no more. He's going to stop testing you on that. He'll test you on something else. Be like, man, Lionel, I can't fool with him in that area no more. <laughs> Let's try something else. That's the reality. But that comes with spiritual maturity. And that's how we grow up. So thanks so much for everything. Uh, I'm done. Uh, I'll speak a blessing over you and your family. Thank you for your patience. Get into this kingdom of God. Get prepared. Go out to victoryinthekingdomofgod.com. Check out the notes. Be prepared to get into these parables. Dig in. Place a demand on the Holy Spirit. If you have not already registered for kingdom curriculum, I don't know what you're waiting on. Get in there. Dig in. Listen to the videos. OK, in their entirety. Prove them uh as as quickly as you choose to do that okay if you have registered but just haven't finished the videos i don't know what you're waiting on get in that right i put it in there uh for your benefit okay so i encourage you to go out again to victory in the kingdom of god.com you can click on register it doesn't cost you anything doesn't ask you for much of anything so go ahead and do that uh with that being said uh i speak power and the presence of god in your life i expect that you're going to have huge wonderful powerful uh revelation of the kingdom of god and that everyone around you will know something is totally different about this person. I know I saw him yesterday. I know I saw him last week. But there's something different about this person. Something is, is, is so much love. It's so much joy. It's so much peace. It's so much power. I, I don't even. I, can you tell me where it came from? That you're going to have people start to ask, what happened to you? Right? That's what I'm expecting for your life. So thank you again. Have a good night. Love y'all. And see you next Thursday, Thursday Lord willing.